On the evening of March 20th, 1940, while thunderstorms rumbled over New York City, RMS Mauritania II quietly slipped her moorings and headed down the Hudson. Her destination was top secret, and only a handful of observers even noticed her departure. For months, the Cunard White Star Line's greatest liners, including the Queen Mary, the brand new Queen Elizabeth, and the second RMS Mauritania, sheltered in New York Harbor while war raged in Europe, waiting for an opportunity to escape the U-boat-infested North Atlantic and assume their inevitable wartime roles. Moored alongside France's Normandy, the three ships were some of the most valuable assets available to the British Admiralty, who faced the daunting challenge of moving troops and supplies throughout their global empire in their fight against Nazi Germany and its allies. Heavy rains and wind brought visibility down to almost nothing, but the new Mauritania would use the stormy weather as cover as she cleared New York Harbor and sailed into an uncertain future. By September 26, 1934, as the whole of RMS Queen Mary glided down her slipway into the River Clyde, Sir Percy Bates, the chairman of the Cunard White Star Line, had already begun planning the future fleet of his newly merged company. The Queen Mary was always intended to have a roughly equivalent running mate, and plans for what would soon become RMS Queen Elizabeth were already taking shape. With this all set, attention next went to the company's secondary liners. In the mid-1930s, the Cunard White Star Line fleet was a hodgepodge of rapidly aging vessels from both companies. As the economic crisis of the Great Depression eased, the company was able to begin planning replacements for these older ships. With mounting competition from the French, Germans, and Italians, Sir Percy Bates realized that any new liner, even those dedicated to less prestigious routes, would need to meet the standards of luxury and comfort set by the company's flagships. Bates was quoted as saying, I regard the first and second lines of ships not as alternatives, but as complementary to each other. This decision was also practical. With just two liners dedicated to the premier Southampton to New York route, it was prudent to build a secondary liner that could be drawn on without compromising any of the luxuries passengers had come to expect if either the Queen Mary or Queen Elizabeth had to undergo maintenance or experienced any other interruption in service. Plans began to take shape for the new approximately 33,000 ton intermediate liner. Bids were submitted at 1,775,000 pounds from three different shipyards, including Swan Hunter, Camel Laird, and Harland and & Wolf. In the end, Camel Laird & Company in Birkenhead offered the most favorable payment terms and they were awarded the project. The new ship would be the largest ever constructed in England at the time. This was also the first project from the newly merged Cunard White Star Line to be funded by the company without any government subsidies. Dubbed hold number 1029, her keel was laid down on May 24, 1937. She was designed primarily to serve the London to New York route, and she would be the largest vessel to ever navigate the Thames and use the Royal Docks. A few years before, in July 1935, Cunard White Star sent one of the most iconic and beloved ocean liners in history to the breakers, the RMS Mauritania. Not long after construction began, it was proposed that hole number 1029 should be named Mauritania. Sir Percy Bates was not keen on the idea, but several of the company's directors felt that the high level of name recognition could help elevate the new liner. And on October 20th, 1937, the board of directors officially approved the idea. While she wouldn't break any records like her predecessor, hole number 1029 would carry on the legendary name, RMS Mauritania. And faces at Birkenhead waited for the gleaming hull of the new Mauritania to go down to the water. She bears a famous name. The old Mauritania sailed on her maiden voyage in 1907. On July 28, 1938, after 14 months of construction, the second RMS Mauritania was ready to launch. Stormy weather threatened to delay the event, but the skies cleared just in time, 
as 50,000 spectators gathered at the Camel Laird shipyard in Birkenhead. She was christened by Lady Bates, the wife of Chairman Sir Percy Bates. At 12.15 p.m., after a brief speech, Lady Bates smashed a bottle of wine over her bow and pressed a button to release the massive hole. In just 50 seconds, she slid down the number six slipway into the Mersey River. Eight tugs then towed her to the fitting out berth, where she would be completed over the next 15 months alongside the aircraft carrier Ark Royal, a harbinger of what lay just on the horizon. The Mauritania was launched only a few months after the RMS Queen Elizabeth and built nearly in tandem. Her design language closely matched her significantly larger fleet mate. Her superstructure featured a tiered rounded bridge with two funnels that left ample deck space. She had berths to accommodate 404 passengers in first class, called cabin class, 450 in second class, and 470 in tourist class. Her passenger spaces spanned 10 decks and closely followed the restrained Art Deco stylings of the Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth. A number of leading British artists were responsible for her interiors. Most notably, the artist Charles Cameron Bailey created a 13-foot or 4-meter carving that depicted the two Mauritanias on the North Atlantic for her cabin class restaurant. The room also featured other subtle nods to the first Mauritania, including glass panels with etched star constellations from her launch, maiden voyage, and final voyage. Her grand hall was decorated by the artist Charles Gerard and featured red, black, and gold lacquered panels themed after the birth of speed, depicting a herd of antelope at various stages of life. While her wood veneers, layouts, and overall style were reminiscent of the larger queens, great care was taken to craft spaces that were unique but equally grand and comfortable. They were impressive but not intimidating or overwhelming, presenting a homely comfort that passengers loved. When completed, the RMS Mauritania was 772 feet or 235 meters in length, with a beam of 89 feet or 27 meters, and came in at 35,739 gross registered tons. She was powered by six oil-fired boilers that fed steam to two sets of Parsons single reduction geared turbines generating 42,000 shaft horsepower and achieving a 23 knot service speed. By the spring of 1939, she was nearing completion and underwent sea trials from May 31st to June 3rd. She was accepted and handed over to the Cunard White Star Line on June 10, 1939. She left Liverpool for her maiden voyage at 7.40 p.m. on Saturday, June 17th, 1939, commanded by Captain A.T. Brown who had previously commanded the first Mauritania at the end of her career. She arrived in New York on June 24th after an uneventful crossing. While her maiden voyage was widely considered a success, attention was shifting to the unfolding crisis in Europe. She would make only a handful of transatlantic crossings before Nazi Germany invaded Poland, initiating a war that would change everything for the new Mauritania. Mauritania left New York bound for London on Saturday, August 26, 1939. Five days into the voyage, she received an urgent message from the Cunard White Star Line ordering her to proceed to Southampton at all haste where the voyage will terminate. Just one day later, Germany invaded Poland and on September 3rd, Britain declared war on Nazi Germany. Soon after arriving in Southampton, the ship was painted a dull battleship gray and her portholes were blacked out. She was armed with two 3-inch anti-aircraft guns and one 6-inch gun installed on her aft deck. The Mauritania departed for New York on September 14, 1939, with 698 passengers, mostly United States citizens, fleeing Europe. This would be her last passenger voyage until the end of the war. On September 15, William Joyce, popularly known as Lord Haha, -Ha, the host of a German radio propaganda program called Germany Calling, announced that the Mauritania had been sunk by a German U-boat while attempting a cowardly escape. Germany Calling was surprisingly popular among the British public, with 6 million regular listeners and up to 18 million occasional listeners at the height of its popularity. While listeners knew that the program was Nazi propaganda, many listened to hear what the other side was saying. 
They also found Lord Ha Ha an engaging and entertaining host. Until 1942, the program would include readings of the news. This would mix real news with made-up or exaggerated reports designed to create unrest. Listeners never quite knew when the reports were accurate, especially in the early days of the broadcast, and the news that the Mauritania had been sunk raised a great deal of alarm until the reports were quickly debunked by the BBC. Mauritania made a journey to New York safely and returned to Liverpool on October 7th. Her movements were quickly broadcast by Lord Haha, ha, including her location in Liverpool. It was well known that the Germans closely monitored the movement of major British ships, but the reports still raised anxiety. While far from the biggest ship in the world at the time, the Mauritania still presented a large and highly visible target in Liverpool for Luftwaffe bombers. After several weeks, it was finally decided that in order to protect the valuable liner, she had to be moved. On December 10th, she quietly left Liverpool, and after arriving in New York, she was docked at Pier 90 alongside the Normandy and Queen Mary, where she would sit idle for months. On March 6th, 1940, she was moved to make space for the Queen Elizabeth. That same day, she was officially requisitioned by the British Admiralty, and Cunard immediately began removing her luxurious fittings, storing them in New York for the duration of the war. In the middle of the night on March 18th, a small crew was secretly transferred from the RMS Antonia, and on a stormy evening on March 20th, the Mauritania quietly slipped out of New York Harbor. Five days later, she arrived in Panama. Under tight security and cover from the United States Air Force, she passed through the canal and continued on to San Francisco, where the rest of her luxurious fittings were removed and placed in storage. She then sailed to Sydney, Australia, where she underwent further conversions at the Cockatoo Dockyard Company to prepare for her new role as a troop ship, a role that would push the new Mauritania to her limits. By May 1940, Mauritania was ready to begin her service as a troop transport. Her first voyage left Sydney on May 5th with 2,184 Australian soldiers. She picked up additional men in Fremantle and 48 Red Cross nurses in Cape Town before joining a convoy bound for Greenwich, Scotland. The convoy sailed at 19 knots, well below the speed Mauritania was capable of reaching. When the voyage was completed on June 22nd, Mauritania's captain requested an urgent meeting with the Ministry of Shipping where he expressed concern that the slower convoy made the Mauritania vulnerable to submarine attacks. He requested that his ship be included in faster convoys going forward. At first, this request was denied, but by spring 1941, it was accepted. In April 1941, she was included in Convoy US-10, one of the largest troop transport convoys ever assembled. Leaving from Sydney, Australia, several of the world's largest liners including the Queen Mary, Queen Elizabeth, Ile-de-France, New Amsterdam, Aquitania, and the Empress of Britain. The convoy traveled at 26 knots. While the speed pushed Mauritania to her limits, she performed beautifully. She carried 4,400 New Zealand troops. The massive convoy traveled in strict columns 1,000 feet or 305 meters apart, following a zigzag course escorted by one heavy cruiser and a number of light cruisers. They were shattered by the battleship HMS Howe and two destroyers. Not long after taking part in the convoy, the Mauritania narrowly escaped disaster. On May 7th, friend of the channel, Ile de France, left Durban with 5,000 British and Australian troops. She sailed on a zigzag course at 22 knots on her way to Bombay. The Mauritania shared the same route, sailing in the opposite direction carrying around 6,500 troops on each voyage. She traveled at an average speed of 26 knots. On the night of May 15, 1941, a monsoon raged over the Indian Ocean, with heavy rain, massive swells, and high winds that reduced visibility to almost nothing. The two liners, each traveling at their maximum speeds unescorted, with all of their lights completely blocked out, were scheduled to pass each other in the early morning at just 50 miles apart. Just before 4 a.m. on the morning of May 16th, First Officer Reg Elward was on watch on Mauritania's bridge when he suddenly heard a lookout shouting, smoke dead ahead. 
Aylward raised his binoculars just in time to catch sight of the massive Ile de France, steaming straight for them. He shouted, ship dead ahead on collision course, hard to starboard, hard to starboard now. Meanwhile, Officer Hubert Roundtree was standing on the bridge of the Ile de France when he saw the mass of the Mauritania screaming toward them. He shouted the same command, but to his dismay and the dismay of First Officer Aylward on the Mauritania, neither ship responded in time as they barreled toward each other. A moment later, the two great ships smashed past each other, missing a collision by only a few feet. Witnesses on both ships said they passed so close you could reach out and touch the other vessel. The maneuver to avoid collision and the rush of oncoming water from the passing liner mixed with the storm was so violent that the Mauritania's crew claimed that she nearly leapt out of the water and came crashing down before swaying violently to starboard and then back to port before finally righting herself. Officers and crew on both ships were given severe warnings from Vice Admiral Sir Charles Woodhouse and the embarrassing event was ordered classified. The Mauritania continued on her trooping duties. In 1943, she was transferred to the North Atlantic, where she began carrying American and Canadian troops to Europe in the build-up to the invasion of Normandy. Over the course of the war, she carried 350,178 troops and traveled an astonishing 542,446 miles. Following the war, she sailed a number of voyages repatriating troops and their families. Finally, on September 2nd, 1946, she was returned to Cunard. It was clear that she had been driven hard during the war when she arrived at the Gladstone Dock in Liverpool, where she would undergo a badly needed refit to restore her to her pre-war glory. Over the course of seven months, RMS Mauritania was extensively refurbished at a cost of one million pounds. 75% of her furnishings had to be shipped from the United States and Australia. 300 cabins were completely rebuilt and 100 tourist class cabins were removed to improve and expand her crew quarters. Air conditioning was installed in parts of the ship and her classes were redesignated to first cabin and tourist. She re-entered passenger service on April 26, 1947, sailing from Liverpool to New York. After one more voyage, she was moved to the Southampton to New York route, acting as a relief ship for the Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth. Her original London to New York service was discontinued after the war. That winter, she began offering cruises from New York to the West Indies and the Caribbean. Over the next 15 years, the Mauritania enjoyed a relatively uneventful career. She was popular with passengers, and some even preferred her over the larger queens. But by the early 1960s, her passenger numbers began to dwindle. Air conditioning was installed throughout the entire ship in 1957, but even her cruises soon waned in popularity. In October 1962, she was painted a pale green to match her more popular fleetmate, the Coronia. But Mauritania began her post-war cruise career offering affordable cruises, which kept her from sharing the exclusive reputation of the Coronia, which was known for catering to the ultra-rich. In March 1963, Cunard shifted the Mauritania to the Mediterranean, but the experiment failed to attract passengers. She was quickly transferred back to offering cruises between New York and the West Indies, but by now she was consistently losing money for the Cunard line. It was clear that the aging liner's days were numbered, and it was soon decided that the 1965 season would be her last. Her final voyage was a 56-day Mediterranean cruise that left from New York in September 1965. Not long after that voyage, she returned to Southampton, and on November 10th, it was announced that she would be put up for sale. Her last run was commanded by her master since 1962, Captain John Treasure Jones, a name that made a life at sea all but a requirement. On November 23rd, she arrived at Inverkeithing Fife, where she was soon scrapped. Despite her famous name, the second Mauritania never quite reached the iconic status of her predecessor, but she was a beloved and reliable ship that represented the culmination of the ocean liner era. She was comfortable, powerful, and beautiful. A lovely and unforgettable way 
to cross the world's oceans. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. I studied film in college. While that helped me make this video, it didn't do much to help me understand the physics behind the near collision between the Mauritania and the Ile de France. If you're anything like me, you're always looking to better understand how things work. That's why I'm excited to talk about this video sponsor, Brilliant.org. No matter what level you're at, Brilliant is the best way to learn about math and computer science. They have thousands of fun and interactive lessons on everything from foundational and advanced math to AI, data science, physics, and more, with new lessons added every month. The near collision between the Mauritania and the Ile de France is a great example of the physics that mariners need to understand when piloting massive ocean liners. Brilliant has a fantastic course on classical mechanics that helps you learn about the core principles of the physics behind matter and motion. This course is an effective way to learn why a massive ship like the Mauritania will continue barreling straight forward even with her rudder completely hard over. To try everything Brilliant has to offer free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash biggleboats or click on the link in the description. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Thank you again to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Thank you so much for watching. What do you think of the second Mauritania? Where do you think she ranks compared to other Cunarders from the post-war period? If you enjoyed this one, help the channel grow with a like and subscribe for more videos like this one. I'd like to give a special shout out to my supporters on Patreon. They said my screenplay was the perfect combination of art and commerce, and I can't think of a better compliment. Alright crew, that's all I've got. Until the next one, be nice to people.